Welcome to church. We invite you to worship with us as we sing praises to our Heavenly Father.
Greetings everybody, it's my joy to bring the announcements or we'd rather call them words of encouragement really I guess at this particular time. So with that in mind, just want to say thanks so much for keeping in touch with, uh, with each other and again, you've probably heard us say it and we'll keep saying it's just so important that we continue to do this and perhaps even more so during this, uh, these times of physical restrictions. And uh, I'd just like to encourage you, now here's a bit of a challenging thought for you. Maybe uh, even contact somebody who may not be in your normal circle of friends or circle of contacts. Um, it'd be lovely if you could perhaps uh, just think of someone that you haven't uh, obviously seen for a while or, or have heard for a while and, and just get on the phone and give them a ring or drop them a text or an email or, or something like that just to uh, let somebody know that you've been thinking of them. That could really make someone's day. So I encourage you to do that. So don't just stick to your friends and people that you're comfortable with. Get outside the comfort zone a little bit and maybe contact somebody that you haven't contacted for quite some time. Um, it's very special. I've done that and I'm sure the pastors have done that and we'd encourage you guys to do it as well. Um, we'd also want to encourage you, uh, please continue to, uh, to have your daily devotional times. This is a, a very special time when you and the Lord get alone together and uh, have time in the Word. Uh, have a little devotional or if you're not sure what to do, contact one of us and we'll encourage you to, to keep the devotional times coming. Just have those precious times with God listening to what God says to you and then having that opportunity for you to say back to God what, what uh, you'd like to say to Him. So uh, keep those things in mind. Keep growing in your own personal devotional time, your love for the Lord and uh, your, your knowledge, your desire to keep growing and, and, and knowing His Word and how that applies to your life. So we certainly encourage you to do that. Also want you to just uh, continue to tune in. Obviously you are now, if you're seeing this and listening to this, tune in to our online services each Sunday. And, uh, and look, feel free to tell others. We'd encourage you to tell others about what's happening at, at SDBC online. People who are not uh, involved in their own church or can't do this sort of thing in their own church, then tell them about SDBC and give them the, the web address and so on so that uh, uh, they may be able to tune in with, them, with us as well. Uh, we just want to continue to thank God and to praise His wonderful name for the giving of, of His people. Uh, so thank you so much. If you're giving to the work of the church, um, this is just uh, uh, so encouraging for the ministries of this church. We can continue to meet obligations, our, our, our ministry commitments through your giving. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, God bless you as we continue together to worship the Lord together and to join together and keep connected together as a church. Bless you. Hello, I'm Rebecca Lyons and I'm standing outside the Oasis in Austria. We've been living here for the past seven years and ministering to refugees. The Oasis is located diagonally opposite um, the tram station which goes to Vienna in a little town called Treiskirchen. Just down the road here, you can see um, the street that leads to Austria's largest refugee receiving centre. And the refugees are um, allowed out of the camp until about 10 o'clock at night, and they come and join us for different programs and activities at the Oasis. Well, it's been nearly a year since we visited you last year, and since then we've come back to Vienna. Um, we moved into a new apartment, um, we began back our refugee ministry at the Oasis and in Vienna and we spent four months in intensive German classes, so five days a week, three hours a day, as we had to pass an integration and German language exam for our next visa renewal. And we're happy to say that just before Christmas we sat that exam and found out in January that we passed the exam. And so we were then able to put in our application for a five-year um, residence permit and we're waiting to hear what happens about that. In Vienna, we've been reconnecting with refugees that we've been building relationships with for the past few years. And we've also been um, furthering our connections with Christians and the local church in Vienna and connecting them with refugees and the ministry at the Oasis. Well, at the Oasis on Wednesday nights, we have Bible talk and question and answer time. At the moment, we've had about 10 to 20 people coming every week. Uh, in particular, there's an Iranian man who's been asking a lot of questions and uh, we've been able to share uh, a lot from God's word with him. Um, and he, he asked us the last, the last time, he asked us to 
pray that um, he would be able to forgive uh, people. Uh, we've been talking about forgiveness uh, and how Jesus has forgiven us and has called us to forgive others. And his, some things have been done to him in the past and, and possibly on his way over too um, by people. And he's struggling to, uh, to forgive them. And he's asked us to pray for him. Uh, so, yeah, it's just uh, amazing to see how God's working in people's lives. It's been really wonderful having not only women and children from the camp come to our programs, but also um, to have some women who have moved into the community now coming regularly to our um, Wednesday afternoon women and children's program and also to our Friday evening program. And this has meant that we've been able to um, build relationships with them and be a, have the ability to have deeper discussions with them and they've shown interest in learning more about what we believe as Christians. We've also had um, some more volunteers join our programs and I think particularly of one lovely Austrian lady who comes regularly with her five children she also has a, a passion for baking and that's been really wonderful as well there's a Syrian lady who's been coming um, to our programs and acts as an interpreter and she's been able to um, fill in a gap where we can communicate more clearly with the Arabic speakers at the moment in our discipleship group, we have three people uh, from Iran. They're actually a family unit, a father, son, and daughter. And they had to flee Iran because the wife of the, of the father uh, notified the authorities that he had become a Christian. Um, and so they had to uh, flee persecution and uh, apply for asylum in Austria. Uh, it's very difficult for the family and um, to yeah, to work through the pain not only of uh, leaving your country but to have someone that they trusted uh, to betray them and so yeah it's um, going to be a long journey for them um, but we know God is with them. As you may already be aware at the end of January the board of International Teams Australia announced um, its decision that um, international teams would be closing and so we're currently in process um, discussing with another missionary organization as we now need to find uh, a new sending body. For us here in Austria things will pretty much stay the same for our day-to-day -day activities and we'll still continue working with international teams Austria at the Oasis and in Vienna. Due to rules by the Austrian government uh, the Oasis has had to close. There have been cases of the coronavirus recorded in the refugee camp, so the camp is also in quarantine. Um, we cannot leave our house except to buy food uh, or go to the pharmacy. Um, so we've had to rely on technology a lot to continue uh, team meetings at the Oasis. Uh, so we're using Skype and Zoom uh, to also connect with refugees our discipleship group is run on Skype or WhatsApp. And so we're just thankful for this technology that enables us to still meet with the refugees. And of course, like everyone, we really look forward to uh, being able to meet together face to face again. During lockdown, we continue to connect with refugees as we check in on them and encourage them and see if they have any needs that we can help with. Our son Brendan is continuing his schooling online. Um, our visas are actually on hold now as the Immigration Department office has closed. So we'd appreciate your prayers that um, everything will still go smoothly with our visa renewal. Thanks so much for partnering with us. We're also praying for you during this difficult time. Stay safe. God bless. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Hi guys, Pastor Bren here with another message for the kids. Here in another local park with the Crows of Babylon in the background, uh, if you can hear them contributing to our conversation. And today we're going to talk again about Daniel. We're going to carry on in the book of Daniel onwards to chapter 6. And Daniel's been through a lot in his time and <laughs> he gets to go through a bit more. And so listen up and hear the story about Daniel and the lion's den. Now Daniel had been a a servant, a helper under several kings in his time. One was King Nebuchadnezzar we talked about before. But in this story, it's a little bit later, and he's a servant under King Darius of Persia. And he was such a good servant that Darius was really fond of him. Darius was so happy with him, he was giving him extra promotions and, and extra responsibility. He was really uh, lifting him up. And there were some other advisors of King Darius who didn't like Daniel at all. They didn't like him personally. They didn't like him because he served God. And they concocted a plan. They got together and they decided that if they could get the king to make a law that would catch Daniel in it, then even the king couldn't save Daniel. And so they got to the king and they suggested to the king, hey, we would like you to make a law that says for a certain period of time, no one is going to be allowed to pray to any god, to anyone, except to you, King Darius. And if anyone is caught praying to anyone but you, then they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. They're going to be executed. And Darius thought about this, and it seemed like a good idea to him. And so he signed off on this law. And so what do you think happened? Well, Daniel is a faithful servant of God. Daniel's not going to stop praying to God just because he's told by someone else, stop praying to God. So he started to pray at home alone instead of in public. But even then, these guys who didn't like him, these other advisors, they found a way to sneak in and, and to peek through and to see him praying in his own home. And they reported this to King Darius. And they said, King Darius, we've caught Daniel, your servant, praying during this time, and you've made the law, and you... Having made that law, you can't turn that away. You can't defeat the law that you've made. You're going to have to follow through on it. And Darius didn't like this because he liked Daniel very much. But he had to be true to his word. So, with great sadness, he had Daniel thrown into the lion's den. And then the lion's den was covered up with a big rock and sealed so that uh, nothing could come out. And the day after, King Darius came running back to the lion's den and had the uh, the stone taken away from the hole and he called down hoping he said Daniel are you alive are you still in there has your God the one you've been praying to all this time saved you from these lions and he heard Daniel's voice coming back to him say yeah yeah he did <laughs> my God is faithful my God is good and he saved me from these lions they haven't attacked me he's proved that he's real and Darius was so relieved he had Daniel taken out of the lion's den and once Daniel was safe he had the guys who had accused Daniel, who had concocted this plan to have Daniel killed, thrown to the lion's den themselves, and the lions weren't so nice to them. And King Darius made a decree, and he said to all the people of his kingdom that the God of Daniel will be respected and will be praised, because he is the God who saves and delivers. Now you guys know like I do, but if your parents tell you something once, it's important. If they tell you twice in a row, it's really important, and you shouldn't forget it. And that's kind of what happens in the book of Daniel here. Because you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they refused to worship an idol, they were thrown into a furnace of fire, but God saved them from being burned up, and the king's heart was changed. And in the case of Daniel, he refused to stop praying to God, he was thrown into a lion's den, but God saved him, and the king's heart was changed. And so the lesson is repeated twice. It happens twice in the same kind of period of time in the lives of the same people. And that lesson remains the same for us, that God's the most important thing. That no one gets to tell us to stop worshipping God or to stop praying to God. And particularly in Daniel's case, the lesson is that when we pray to God, it's more important than anything anyone else says. We have to maintain that relationship by spending our time devoted to Him, by speaking to God, by praying like He asks us to no matter what anyone else says, and really no matter the cost. And that's the story. So kids, God bless you. Let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you once again that you've put us in a country and a time where we don't have to be afraid to pray to you. 
We thank you, we can come to you freely, we can give you our burdens, we can ask you for help, we can trust you for protection and blessing. What a wonderful and faithful God you are. Help us to be faithful to you as well. We pray that in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. That's all for me from this week. Thank you to the Kids Church leaders for everything they do as well during this time. And thank you kids and families for tuning in and for listening to this story. And please put together that craft, put together your best drawings, your dioramas, your Lego, whatever it is you want to do to tell this story again in the way that you heard it so that we can hear it from you. Thanks so much, guys. God bless you. May I have the privilege of leading us all together in prayer. Let's just pray together. A loving Father, thank you for your word that reminds us that the mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets, from Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. 
a fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. And Lord, it just reminds us again of your sovereign power and your mightiness and the fact that we can put our trust in a God like you, an all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all-present God who's not separated from his people, even though we might be separated from each other at the moment. Lord, you're the one who uh, tells us again and again that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So we bless your name and we thank you today for being with us. We thank you that we're able to have online church, Lord, and we thank you once again that you're a God who has no limitations in speaking to us and blessing us. And uh, Lord, we pray that we'll continue to grow even closer to you during these times. Speak to us, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what you're saying to us, what you will so add through your, through your word. Uh, so, Lord, we just bless you. And even during this COVID-19 uh, restrictions, we thank you that you again are with us and uh, will never forsake us, will never leave us. So we bless your name for that. Lord, we pray that you will meet those who are maybe feeling particularly lonely at this time. Perhaps a bit felt, uh, maybe they feel isolated and cut off. Father, we pray that they may sense an extra special measure of your grace and of your presence with them. May they know that round about and underneath are those everlasting arms. So bless them and be close to these folks, Lord. Help us all, we pray, to connect with each other during this, uh, even during this coming week. May you give us the courage. May you give us the promptings to pick up that phone or to send an email or a card to somebody that perhaps we... Uh, don't normally have contact with. So Lord, help us to do these things and to bring glory to your name and to encourage and build up a brother or a sister in Christ by doing these things. We pray that you will meet us in our own personal devotional times. May you so burden our hearts and encourage our hearts to meet with you each day, to have these times with you where we grow closer, where we just continue to flourish and, and grow individually and as a church. Uh, even during this time when we are not able to uh, uh, corporately meet together. Uh, but we're looking forward to that day and we pray soon, Lord, that that will take place. But in the meantime, may you help us to keep growing and keep going in our faith and in our relationships with you. We pray for our connect groups that are meeting online as well. May they also be a blessing. May you uh, indeed encourage people to keep that connection going, keep these little groups going. Lord, we thank you for the technology that allows people to meet online and to do these various things through this, these social media platforms. We thank you, Lord, for your hand in that. And we pray uh, your rich blessing in these areas of ministry. I want to commit our school chaplains to you today and pray that you will watch over them, each one. Thank you for them. Father, for the, uh, uh, the chaplains who are serving you faithfully in our schools, we pray that you encourage them, you grow them and keep them, uh, keep them going in their own faith and in their own ministries, we pray. And uh, Lord, for our missionaries again, we lovingly commend each and every one of them to you, praying that they will also sense that your presence is so near to them. You're the God who sticks closer than a brother. And so we ask that your hand would be upon all of our missionaries. I want to pray particularly for, for Yasmin Henry uh, today in her ministry with power to change. Pray that you'll bless this lady and may she make those connections and have those meaningful conversations uh, with her, her people, uh, with those uh, that you bring across her path. Bless her, we do pray. We lovingly commend these folks to you and our whole service. Again, may you bless the worship time that we enjoy together here today. And uh, once again, thank you for the fact that your people are giving faithfully to your ministries, to your work here in Australia and even overseas. So thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are uh, blessing this church uh, in the budget that it's able to maintain so that we can, uh, Lord, continue to meet our ministry obligations and commitments. Bless the giving that your people will do now as we commit ourselves into your loving hands in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
fly through the storm and through the fire. Mary's crown that sets me free. Jesus Christ who reigns in me. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus reading is from Obadiah verses 2 to 3 and verses 4, 10, 12, 14 and 15. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars. From there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered in shame. You will be destroyed forever. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Morning, everybody. We are continuing our series on the Minor Prophets. Let me pray, and then we're jumping into Obadiah and Jonah. Put your seatbelts on because we're going fast. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to share in this way. And we pray that um, through looking at these two Minor Prophets, Obadiah and Jonah, that you might speak to us. You might open our hearts to your word and open your word to our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Obadiah, I'm going to try and do this in rapid speed, so we'll wait and see how we go. Um, and if what I... Mm, 
We don't know much about Obadiah. We know his name. We don't know the name of his father. We don't know the name of his family. We don't know if he had a girlfriend. We don't know the sandal size. We know nothing about him. There are 12 Obadiahs in the Old Testament and we cannot link him to any one of them. Might be, but we don't know. As far as we know, he stands alone. We don't know the date in which he lived. And it turns out that that's not important anyway because it's the message of Obadiah that is significant for us, part of God's word. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament, 21 verses. But it's not the shortest chapter in the Old Testament. Psalm 117 is certainly shorter, but so are 80% of the Psalms are shorter than Nehemiah. He's never quoted in the New Testament. But interestingly, he is quoted, or he quotes, Jeremiah 49. If you look at Jeremiah 49 and Obadiah, you'll find some significant word-for-word parallels. One of them is quoting the other. We don't know which way it goes. Um, Obadiah preaches about the country of Edom and he preaches to the country, the nation of Edom. There's a map that will appear and I'd like you to look at that and you can see the location of Edom in the southeast of the Dead Sea. Um, The southern boundary of Edom was in fact the Gulf of Aquaba famous town that you may have heard of is Temin, and f- which is about eight kilometres east of Petra. And from that came a very famous man, Eliphaz, who's one of Job's friends that we read in the book of Job. Edom had a unique history. They shared a background history with Israel because Esau and Jacob were twin brothers. And from Esau comes Edom and from Jacob comes Israel. These two guys that fought in the womb of their mother likewise continued to fight throughout their life but also throughout their nation's histories. For centuries they were in dispute just like in Northern Ireland today or the argument between the Arabs and the Jews and lots of other national conflicts that are going on. Um, The hostility had been there. They hassled one another and significantly whenever Israel was um, invaded then Edom always took the side, always, of those who were invading because they wanted to get rid of their half-brothers, their brothers, their brother nation. Um, The capital of Edom is a place called Petra. I encourage you to look that up and there's some magnificent photos on the internet about that. It's built into Mount Seir. The entrance into the city is through a very narrow pathway. pathway. If you've seen... Um, Indiana Jones and you may have actually seen that pathway entrance it's very narrow at some point you can touch both sides with your hands sometimes it opens out into about 15 feet went for about two kilometers and that narrow entrance meant that they were a very secure city in fact 12 men could defend against a whole army and on numerous occasions that's exactly what happened the city itself was hewn out of rock palaces and houses and Temples and altars were all carved out of the sandstone rock. They were cave dwellers. They lived in the mountains. And their location up high made them likewise smug and secure. They felt proud and very self-sufficient. Well, God's word came to Obadiah to go and preach about and against the city of Edom, the country of Edom. God's word in chapter 1, verse 2 is that he's heard a report where God is summoning the nations to attack and remove Edom from the face of the earth. The reason given in verse 3 is because of the pride of your heart has deceived you. That's the significant verse and the significant attitude in this book. Edom had the attitude of who could bring us down, who could invade us, who could um, destroy us. And God says, I heard what you were saying and I can, and I will. A bit like the Titanic, the amount of pride and arrogance in the building of that ship, and the architect says to the captain that not even God himself could destroy the Titanic. Well, they're dangerous words, aren't they? And we know the story of what happened to the Titanic. So similarly with Edom, this very proud, arrogant city, very violent place as well, uh, God was going to remove God, in fact, says in verse 5, if thieves broke into your place, surely they would leave something. That's what normally happens. They take what's important and leave most things. But God says when thieves break into Edom, 
you're going to be ransacked. They're going to search every nook and cranny and everything is going to be robbed and removed. You're going to be slaughtered. In verse 18 of the book, we're told that there'll be no survivors. And a couple hundred years later, Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 5, will testify to exactly that. None are left, none remaining. Why is all this happening? Well, Obadiah tells us in verses 10 to 14, you can see a list of the things. They were violent, they stood aloof, they rejoiced when Israel was invaded, they pillaged, they even stood at the crossroads when people were fleeing from Jerusalem and either arrested them or killed them themselves and then handed them over to the invading Babylonians. They should not have behaved like that against their brother nation, God says. And that's why he's going to hold them to account. When you come to verse 15, suddenly there is a change. We're not just talking about Edom now, we're now talking about all nations. And God draws a parallel through the prophet of saying that just as Edom has going to be held to account for how they treated Israel, so all nations will be called to account by the way, for the way that they have treated God's people, the Jewish people. Verse 16 talks about how Edom had actually gone into Mount Zion after Israel had been decimated and they celebrated. There was dancing in the streets and drinking wine and all sorts of things. And God says in verse 16, as you drank on my holy hill, so now you'll drink the cup of my wrath and it'll be for condemnation. Well, the book of Obadiah is a little book, but it's got a big message for us that's still relevant. The God of Israel is the God of all nations and is the God of all people. He's the one and only God, the true and living God, and he will judge his people and all people, calling them to account. Everything is under his control. He is the one who appoints nations and assigns times and boundaries. He's the one who raises up and removes empires. And all of us are called to face him. Judgment is not God's final word, as we'll see in a moment. But the book emphasizes that God hates pride. He hates that when we look down on others. And God notices how we treat others, even our enemies. And Proverbs 24, verses 17 to 18 reminds us, do not gloat when your enemy fails. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. Or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. God notices how we treat other people. And he doesn't want us to react like that because it contradicts his heart. We'll return to that theme when we get to the book of Jonah. God hates pride. And the book of Abediah also teaches us that there is a divine principle on how God works in the world. Some people call it karma. Some people call it what goes around, comes around. That's just a human observation on the reality that God himself is working out what you sow is what you will reap. The way you treat others is what will return upon your head. The wheels of God's providence might turn slowly, but they grind exceedingly small, as one of the Puritans once said. Judgment is not God's final word. God's plan to restore his people will not be frustrated. Verses 17 to the end of the book, verse 21, talks about how Israel will be restored. Edom will be gone and gone forever. But Israel will return to their land. Israel's land will expand and they will rule. God will deliver his people. God will destroy the enemy and God will establish his kingdom. Let's turn to the book of Jonah and see some of these similar truths, but also something more revealing about the God of the Old Testament. Jonah is not really a prophecy. While he's amongst the minor prophets, it's not so much about what he predicted or said or taught. It's really about him as a person. It's about Jonah, the prophet. And then even so, it's what he did. And the book emphasizes even more so what God is like and what God did. And that's what the significant lesson that we'll learn from Jonah. The book of Jonah falls into two parts, uh, paralleling the two commissions that come. In chapter 1, verse 1, it's the word of the Lord came to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, and of course he flees. It's repeated, chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to, Nona, uh, to Jonah a second time. That's the second commission, arise and go to Nineveh. 
in the first part of the book, chapters 1 and 2, he runs from God and God pursues him, chases him, rescues him. In the second book, he reluctantly obeys, he reluctantly goes to Nineveh, serves God, but he also gives God a serve. And we'll come to that in chapter 4. Take note as you read through the book of Jonah of the questions. The book is full of questions and they're a key to the meaning of the book. In fact, the book ends with a question which is not answered, which is significant. People have problems with the book of Jonah. Can a man really be swallowed by a large fish and survive? Can a whole pagan city, over a million people, repent and turn to God quickly and so completely? Can a plant grow up overnight and be gone so quickly? Well, people have all sorts of questions and issues. So let's come to Jonah. What sort of a book is it? Well, for me, it's literal history. It's a record of what actually did happen. It's not myth. It's not a fable. It's not an allegory. It really did happen. Why do I say that? Well, Jonah was a real person, a real prophet in space-time history. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. And even more importantly, the Lord Jesus himself refers to Jonah and to the Ninevites repenting and turning to God. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 to 41, the Lord Jesus links the reality, the historical reality of Jonah and Nineveh as a picture of his own death and resurrection. So Jonah is a simple story, a simple narrative with statements recorded of what actually happened. Well, what happened? Most of us are familiar with the story. Jonah is commissioned to go to Nineveh, chapter 1 and following. Nineveh, we are told in chapter 1 and verse 2, that it is a great city, a big city, huge. And it's also a bad city. It's full of wickedness. It's the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It's on the Tigris River. And we're told in chapter 3 and verse 3 that it takes three days to go through it. Normally in those days you could work 20 miles in a day and so 60 miles through, that's a large city, about 100 kilometres. In fact, Nineveh it would appear from archaeological findings that it was four cities that had combined and were enclosed in a wall of, um, on the Tigris River and these four cities numbered well over a million people. Chapter 4 verse 11 gives us some numbers. The walls of the city were over 30 metres tall. They were five metres wide. The streets were 35 kilometres long. It was a very brutal and violent city. They did terrible things to people. Uh, bodies were piled up in the streets. They would skin people alive and hang them on the wall. And they would mutilate people. They would cut off fingers and hands and feet and ears. and They'd even cut off lips. And then they would pile these up. As you came through the gates of Nineveh, there were piles of skull at the entranceway to put fear into people. It was northeast of Jerusalem, it was about 1,300 kilometres away, and it was in that northeasterly direction. God called Jonah to go there, and Jonah didn't go that way, he went west, southwest. He went down to the place of Joppa, which is on the coast, to get a boat to go to Tarshish, which is at the western end of Spain. He was going as far as he possibly could. And what's significant is that when Jonah gets to Joppa, they just happen to be a ship. They weren't always there. Just a coincidence. But it does indicate that when you are disobedient to God, even the devil himself will open the door for you and he'll provide the transport for you to encourage you to disobey God. Jonah pays his fare, goes on board, and he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. That does not mean that he thinks, because Jonah is a pretty well-informed man and he knows God, and he knows he can't flee from the presence of God because God is everywhere. What it means is he is resigning. I no longer stand in the presence of God to be his servant. I am no longer available to be obedient. I resign, I quit, I'm out of here. That was Jonah's attitude. And Jonah ran away from God, but God pursues him. Verse 4 tells us that the Lord sent a great wind, a violent storm, scared the seasoned sailors, but Jonah wasn't listening. Jonah had gone onto the boat, went down into the bottom of the boat, went down into the bed. He was sound asleep. 
So God sent a storm, Jonah wasn't listening. So God sent the captain who woke him up, asked him some questions and in fact in verse 8, five significant questions. They cast lots, which from their perspective is maybe a bit superstitious, but the book of Proverbs tells us, chapter 16, verse 33, that when you cast the lot, when you roll the dice, even the number that comes up is determined by God. Interesting. God is using non-believers to remind Jonah of what his true identity is. And Jonah's experience is because he's disobeying God, running from God, he's got this going down experience. Down. He goes down to Joppa, down into the ship, down into the bed. Eventually he'll go down into the ocean and down into the fish's belly. When the sailors <clears throat> realise that he is the cause of this storm and their difficulties, their, que their question is, what should we do? Jonah should have said, well, I need to repent and it'll be okay, but he doesn't. He's so determined to be disobedient, he said, I'd rather be dead than preach to the Ninevites. Throw me overboard. Let me drown. Let me die. And then, of course, the storm gets worse and the ship breaks up and they throw cargo overboard. And Jonah's disobedience is actually hurting other people. And then, eventually, they renege, they throw him overboard. And now God still tries to speak to Jonah. As he sinks down, all the way down to the bottom of the sea, down the bottom of the ocean, God sends a great fish. The Bible says in chapter 1, verse 17, that the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. This is where some people give up and they tell all sorts of stories. And Is it possible for a large fish to swallow a man? Yes, documented lots of times. Is it possible for a large fish to swallow a man for the man to survive? Yeah, it's more difficult. Did Jonah survive? Did he die? Well, I personally think maybe he did didn't breathe but then that would be an, a very great parallel wouldn't it for the Lord Jesus as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the the fish or the whale or whatever it was a large fish so the son of man will be in the belly of the earth as Jesus died so perhaps Jonah died that's a minor point you can think that through as well the issue is not the fish the issue it goes all the way back to Genesis 1:1. If God can bring matter into existence just by speaking, if God can create quadrillion, trillion stars and call them all by name, then appointing and making a huge fish to swallow a man is not difficult for the Lord. Not at all. He could probably also turn water into wine, cure leprosy and blindness and deafness, as we know Jesus did. If God can cause three men in a furnace to stay alive, it's not impossible for the Lord. And the Bible says that he did it. I believe he did it. Jonah is running away from God and he's now as far as he can possibly be. Chapter 2, verse 2, in fact, talks about that he's in the realm of the dead. He's in Sheol. And even there, where he thinks perhaps God's going to be absent, he meets God. God meets up with him and he calls out to God took him a while, but eventually he does pray. When we call out to God, God hears us, wherever we are, however deep we've gone, however guilty we feel or unworthy we feel, if we turn to God like Jonah did, God will hear us and rescue us. And then God commands the fish, chapter 2, verse 10, to vomit Jonah up onto the beach. It's interesting that all through the book of Jonah, the fish... Uh, the wind, the worm, the plant, they're all obedient. Creation obeys the Creator. It's only humans who are disobedient. Well, Jonah is vomited up, cleans up. Chapter 3, the second half of the book, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. There's a whole message there. He's the God of the second chance. He's the God who gives us another opportunity. It's Peter who denies Jesus, and then it's Peter gets recommissioned, John chapter 21. Go to Nineveh and the Bible says, verse 3, that Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Nineveh was a very large city, it took three days to go through it. Jonah went into it one day and he started preaching a very simple message. One city, one message, two lines. In 40 days from now, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. 
I'm pretty sure he didn't deliver it with conviction, and I'm pretty sure he didn't deliver it with compassion, as we'll see in a moment. But the surprising thing is, this is the miracle. The people of Nineveh believed God. They believed what Jonah was saying, and they responded. They turned to God in the hope of mercy. They put on sackcloth, they fasted. Even the king, everybody in the whole city of Nineveh turned back to God. There's this dramatic turning to him. Before we go on, I want to note this. The sailors believed God, but they saw some dramatic signs. They saw the storm suddenly calm down and they repented and turned to God. But the Ninevites, they only heard the word of God. That's God's spirit taking the word of God to make children of God. That's God working through the power of his word. We're not told, and I don't think Jonah shared his experience of being in the belly of the fish. That's God simply using his word and people responding to it. Like in Luke 16, 31, if we don't listen to God's word, then we are the ones who miss out. We need to continue to expose ourselves to his word, ourselves to his word in our minds and our hearts, so that he can transform us into the people he wants us to be. Well, it's a great miracle. 100% of the people of Nineveh repent and turn to God. And Jonah's response to that is in... Um, Chapter 4, verse 1, but, jo but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He was furious. He was very displeased, exceedingly angry. And he's cheesed off. He took himself outside the city, sat on a hill, and was waiting for the 40 days to pass to see if, well, are they going to be destroyed or not? And then God comes to him. And Jonah now explains why he ran away in the first place. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by, by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a God of graciousness and compassion. You're slow to anger and you're abounding in love. You like to have mercy on people. You like to forgive people. I want you to eliminate them. They're terrible people. They're cruel. They don't deserve to be forgiven. Justice has been denied. Ever felt like that? Ever felt like you'd like God to take somebody out? But Jonah, interestingly, knows God's character. He knows what God is like. This is the God of the Old Testament. You know how people often say the God of the New Testament is loving, the God of the Old Testament is cruel and horrible? Well, here is the God of the Old Testament. It was compassionate and gracious and merciful who loves to forgive. And certainly when we do wrong, we want mercy. But when we are wronged, we want justice. Well, justice is certainly coming. But for the moment, mercy is available. So God questions Jonah. More questions. Do you have a right to be angry? To which Jonah says, too right I do. Justice has been denied. These people are terrible and you should judge them. So then God uses creation again, the sun beating down on Jonah and a plant growing up to give him comfort and then sends a worm to kill it and eventually Jonah gets very angry even about the plant dying. God speaks to him, but Jonah's not listening. Jonah cares more about his own personal comfort. He's more concerned about the plant than he is about the million people in the city of Nineveh. And the book ends with God asking a question. Should I not be concerned... For Nineveh, for the 120,000 infants who don't know their left from their right, as well as all of the animals. And the book ends. Silence. What's the answer? What's your answer? I wonder how Jonah responded. How do you respond? I think there's a clue. Let me share it with you. How do we know the story of Jonah? Well, Jonah tells us. Jonah tells us a story against himself. Jonah answers the question by him writing this book to say that he was wrong, that he ran from God when he shouldn't have, that he should have extended God's truth and mercy to those who don't deserve it, but who absolutely need it. So what does the book of Jonah mean for us? Well, several lessons. You cannot escape God's presence. We know that. You can try to hide like Adam. You can try to run like Jonah. But it doesn't work. 
Interestingly, Satan will always open a way for us to be disobedient. He'll encourage it. There'll be a boat just ready for you to head off in the wrong direction. Every step away from God is always downhill, as it was for Jonah. Our willfulness, our willfulness, our stubborn defiance of what God wants, not doing it, won't stop God doing what he wants. If God wants Nineveh reached, guess what? It's going to be reached. And God won't force you, but he does have ways of strongly persuading you. Remember how Moses went to Pharaoh when Pharaoh said, no, this is never going to happen? Well, God persuaded him. So God is very skilled in these ways of persuading us to get on track. The book of Proverbs 15.10 says that severe discipline awaits anyone who turns away from the correct path. God has ways of reaching us. And finally, I think the book of Jonah absolutely teaches us that we are to love our enemies. The book of Obadiah teaches exactly the same truth. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, that we are to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate you, to bless those who curse you, and to pray for those who mistreat you. Is there someone out of our readings of Obadiah and Jonah, is there someone you need to love as your enemy, as your opponent? Then do good to them, bless them, pray for them, because God notices how we treat other people, especially people who mistreat us. The truths of Obadiah and Jonah. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these two books and for these truths. Help us to stop running and to turn and to come to you. Thank you that you love us. Lord, please forgive us. We want to turn to you and choose to follow you and to serve you. What do you want us to do? Could you open our eyes so that we can see the opportunities to share the truths of your mercy and your forgiveness to those around us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you, Pastor Darrell, for your message to us today that God is indeed a God who cares. He's the God of the nations. So let us, uh, let's just pray together as we bring our service to a close. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And God's people all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.